Good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar for December 2023. Uh, before I start this morning, I'd just like to mention that I do have a Twitter feed uh, on which I make tweets periodically, uh, usually every two or three weeks, depending on what's going on in the market. I don't tweet every day. It's just when I think there's something significant. Uh, the link to my uh, Twitter feed is in the description below uh, on this uh, tube. So you want to go there, just have a look. Okay, so uh, we begin in America as usual. Um, at the end of the year, as we are now, analysts are starting to say that the um, U.S. economy might enjoy a soft landing. Despite the rapid rise in interest rates, it's looking more and more likely that the U.S. economy will avoid recession. A recession, of course, is, is uh, defined as two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. <clears throat> so they're, they're hoping that they'll have a soft landing now. More and more analysts are hoping for that. And that's having a positive impact on the stock market. Core inflation, of course, which excludes food and fuel, has been quite stubborn, around 4%, but it fell to 3.7% in September, and the Fed, of course, is trying to get it down to 2%. And because of that, they are saying that interest rates will remain high for longer, maybe until the fourth quarter of 2024. High interest rates, of course, mean that companies with high debt are vulnerable. Long-term debt was mostly refinanced under lower at lower rates during COVID-19. You may recall that <clears throat> during the COVID pandemic, interest rates were dropped right down, and most companies that had long-term debt refinanced during that period, taking advantage of the lower rates. However, most of that debt is now maturing and must be refinanced at higher rates. And as many as half of the companies in America, the large companies in America, are currently unprofitable. As the high interest rates continue, some of them will fold. Bankruptcies will probably rise. The stock market is being driven by high-tech companies, especially those which are involved in artificial intelligence, like NVIDIA, Amazon, and Meta. Artificial intelligence is expected to improve the productivity of almost all companies. And, of course, that increased productivity will feed through into the stock market. The question is, will it be enough to counter the cost of rising debt and rising interest payments? At the same time, uh, I've got on the screen a chart of the uh, oil price, the price of North Sea Brent oil which is a major factor impacting all businesses and consumers in America and everywhere in the world. Brent, as you can see now, is trading for uh, down here at about $77 a barrel. Um, and this is down from its peak just a little while ago in, uh, in September, at the end of September, which was about $96 a barrel. So it's, it's been coming down quite sharply. And, of course, that is very positive for inflation worldwide and especially, of course, important in America. It also improves the profitability of most businesses. There is major support for the oil price at around $72 a barrel, as you can see here I've drawn in the line. If that support is penetrated and the oil price continues to fall, then a soft landing is almost guaranteed for the American economy. Much now depends on whether that support holds or is broken. The Biden administration must be applying plenty of pressure on countries like Saudi Arabia to keep the oil price low. They want the oil price to fall, especially in the lead-up to the November 2024 elections. The U.S. economy added another 150,000 jobs in October, which was much less than was expected. Uh, analysts were predicting 297,000 jobs in, uh, sorry, were predicting more than 150,000. And in September month, uh, we had 297,000 jobs. So uh, that was not so good. 
and the 150,000 jobs in October means that there's definitely some impact coming through from higher interest rates on the economy. The unemployment rate has also ticked up to 3.9%. And these statistics are an indication that the economy may be beginning to slow. The auto workers' strike, of course, had an impact on these figures. GDP, gross domestic product in America, grew in the third quarter by an impressive 5.2%. That is massive when you consider the size of the American economy. A 5.2% growth rate is enormous. Since then, however, growth has slowed in the fourth quarter, and that has raised hopes that interest rates may well have peaked. And the higher for longer prospect does not seem to be bothering investors too much. Looking at the companies in the S&P 500, 98% have now reported for the third quarter, their profits for the third quarter, and 82% of those companies were above analysts' expectations. Their profits were higher than predicted. And 62% had higher revenue turnover than was predicted. Overall, S&P 500 companies earned about 4.8% more in profits in the third quarter of this year than they did in the third quarter of 2022. And this, of course, shows that the largest companies in America are still growing. But growth is generally expected to be lower in the fourth quarter. All right, let's just take a look at that S&P 500 chart um, just to get an idea of what's happening technically to the market. Um, Just going to put a bit more data on the screen here. We go to a two-year chart, uh, pull in a little bit more here. All right, there you can see the all-time high, 4796, made on the 3rd of January 2022. And then this pretty substantial correction, uh, which took it down to a low of 3577 on the 12th of October of the same year, so about 10 months later. Then there was this rally that we're in now, and within that rally there's been a 10.2% correction, as you can see here. Um, now we bounced off the cycle low at 4117 and this was a very strong recovery because you can see it was it was characterized by what are called breakaway gaps where the opening price for one day is higher than the highest price of the previous day okay then we get a gap in the chart known as a breakaway gap and that's a strong indication of bullish sentiment and the bullish sentiment has taken it all the way up to this point at which it's made a higher high than this previous cycle high. So it's gone above 4589, but only just. And now it's moving sideways and hovering, right? Um, I said in my tweet um, the other day, uh, on think on the 20th of November, that after such a strong upward run like this, the experienced technical analyst would expect some kind of sideways movement and even a downward trend, a correction, a smallish correction here. And maybe this is looking more and more like a double top here, this being the first top, that being the second top, than an upside break at this stage. Time will tell. We are convinced, though, that with the S&P 500 where it is now, Uh, It's just 4.77% below this record all-time high from January, 3rd of January, 2022. Um, So we think that it will break above that all-time high fairly soon. And uh, obviously, you know that uh, we have changed our position on this downward trend here. We now believe this to be a correction, a big correction, of course, 25%. uh, But because it's only 10 months and it's only a 25% drop, we believe it's a correction in the long-term bull trend, which began on March in March of 2009. And that bull trend is still ongoing as far as we're concerned. So we believe that that record all-time high over here will be broken probably fairly soon. In fact, we're expecting it to get broken maybe in the Santa Claus rally at the end of this year. Um, So that's something for you uh, to consider. All right, let's move on from the S&P 500. Let's go to Europe and obviously to Ukraine. 
where the war has been uh, grinding on. Uh, Ukraine has now got about a million people in its army to oppose Russia. They're not obviously all fighting soldiers. Many of them are in support of support uh, functions. Western countries continue to supply financial and military aid, but have not yet supplied any foot soldiers, any foot boots on the ground. The strain is starting to show among Ukrainian people after almost two years of war, and especially now that Ukraine's spring offensive did not result in that much progress. Supporters of Ukraine have been disappointed. But Russia is also struggling to find more men for the war. Putin is just about in the process now of conscripting another 170,000 uh, soldiers, and Russia has been taking enormous losses. So far, in the war so far, Russia is estimated to have lost 5,520 tanks, 7,878 artillery systems, and 10,282 armored personnel carriers. Putin has now increased defense spending to 30% of the national budget, which would be somewhere around $700 billion per annum. That compares to the NATO budgets of the 50-odd countries in NATO, which are more than a trillion dollars for defense. Germany has recently said that it will double its aid to Ukraine next year. And remember, Germany is the second largest aid provider to uh, Ukraine. Russia is taking a lot of strain. The ruble continues to be very weak at around one cent, one US cent. And we don't think it will hold that level. Interest rates in, in Russia have doubled to 15%. And there's been a massive flight of capital. In, the 2022, in 2022, the trade surplus in, in Russia was $236 billion. And that was wiped out by net outflows of $239 billion. This year, the trade surplus is much smaller. It shrunk to $27 billion. <clears throat> so Russia is starting to take serious economic strain. Exports to Europe, of course, have collapsed with the sanctions. Much of Russia's reserves have been frozen and are to be used for reparations and, and the rebuilding of Ukraine in due course. The average wage in Russia has dropped to half of what it was. It was about $1,200 a month before the war. Now it's around about $600 uh, per month. Inflation is obviously also a major factor now. Russians have had to cope with in, in enormous and rising casualties in, in the war. The UK Ministry of Defense estimates that last week alone, Russia had about 1,020 casualties per day, most of them killed in the assault on, a, on the small town of Avdivka. The level of casualties is worse than in the assault on Bakhmut. During the World War I, for perspective, Russia lost about 1,100 soldiers killed each day. So this, this is really, really hectic for the Russian people. Body bags are coming home all the time. Everybody knows somebody who's died or been injured in the war. So Putin cannot continue like this for much longer, we don't think. He may be forced to some sort of compromise fairly soon, and that will probably destroy him politically. Ukraine and NATO need to persist for a few more months through the winter, and of course that is going to be very arduous. We expect that to be arduous. But we fully expect that Russia cannot sustain this level of effort and sacrifice. All right, let's turn our attention now to South Africa. I want to begin by looking at uh, the political situation. And, and most importantly, I want to recommend watching uh, Alec Hogg's interview with the DA campaign manager, Greg Krumbach. Krumbach. Greg Krumbach. Um, Krumbach says that the DA now has uh, the, the support from 32% of the South African voting public, while the ANC support is down to 39%. He said that the DA's support has been trending up steadily, and they're now just 7% behind the ANC. We regard his assertion to be factually and statistically sound. And of course, this is very important information for South Africa and for investors on the JSC. It seems that the South African electorate has matured 
and is less interested in the ANC's struggle credentials than in its complete lack of service delivery. Two important facts stand out for most voters. Firstly, the Western Cape is by far the best-run province in South Africa, and that is, of course, run by the DA. Secondly, the DA, unlike the EIANC and the EFF, has no reputation for corruption at all. So they are not corrupt, and they are very good at service delivery, and we think that those two factors are starting to really impact on the voting public. The DA's alliance with other smaller parties may now be sufficient to get the votes to unseat the ANC. With their support at 32% and growing, while the ANC is 39% and shrinking, they don't have to go very far in order to get to a place where with their alliance partners they could win the election next year. By May next year, the DA's position could be even stronger. What is apparent is that the persistent electricity problems and load shedding in South Africa are killing the ANC. If, if of course, the ANC is ousted, then the new government will face a daunting task. It will have enormous corruption and mismanagement to handle, and that has become endemic in almost every government function. Almost every state-owned enterprise is dysfunctional. The police force is incapable of stopping organized crime. Even such basic systems as the rules of the road have collapsed. The new government will take at least a decade, in our opinion, to fix these things. But there may be some immediate positive benefits. First of all, foreign direct investment should improve quickly if the, if the ANC is displaced. And secondly, that would probably benefit a lot of JSC-listed companies, which are currently taking a lot of strain. The ANC, of course, is cognizant of its impending doom and is desperately trying to use its position in the government as the ruling party and to use government funds to bolster its support. You may have read in the paper the, the statements of the Minister of the Presidency, uh, Kombuzo Nchaveni, who said that the private sector has no interest in developing the country and is trying to engineer the collapse of the Ramaphosa administration. Obviously absolute nonsense but it shows the desperation of the ruling party. Clearly, the ANC is trying to blame someone else for its own failures. The ANC is solely to blame for the parlous state of Eskom and Transnet. The private sector, on the other hand, has actually been the victim of their mismanagement. The Minister of Employment and Labor has got a plan to take 15 billion rand from the US UIF savings account and to try and create 2 million jobs before the election next year. This is a thinly disguised effort by the ANC to buy votes. Expect more of these desperate ideas as the election draws closer. And of course the ANC itself is bankrupt, it can't pay its creditors. Um, it's facing uh, having its assets uh, confiscated to, to, re to, to pay debts. So we've got to ask ourselves, if a party cannot manage its own finances, how can it manage the country? Just for a moment, I'd like to look at some other emerging markets, and particularly I'd like to look at what's happened in Argentina. We may think that the country has been very badly managed by the ANC, and I think there's a lot of grounds for that. But in Argentina, the economy is literally collapsing. Inflation is now at 148% which is about 12.3% per month, with interest rates at 133% per annum. The newly elected president, Javier Melier, is going to make the US dollar the official currency and scrap the Argentina central bank. And you mustn't forget that Argentina's economy is about 50% bigger than South Africa's. And what this shows us is that just raising interest rates does not cure inflation if the government continues to print money to pay its expenses. Like Zimbabwe, Argentina has printed its currency out of existence. All right, let's look at the economy now. Uh, the consumer price index came in at 5.9%. That's the inflation rate in October. Uh, that's up from September's 5.4%. 
mainly as a result of higher food and fuel prices. Core inflation was actually slightly down at 4.4%, lower than September's 4.5%. So that means that underlying inflation is well controlled in South Africa, and it compares well with other emerging e economies, not least of which is Argentina. The CPI is expected to move back to the midpoint of the target range, around 4.5% uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in 2024. Looking at the ratings agencies, Standard and & Poor's and Fitch both have, SA, have South Africa on a BB- rating, while Moody's has us one notch higher at BA2. But both of those are below, in, all of those are in below investment grade. Standard & Poor's says that the budget deficit could rise to 83% of gross domestic product by 2027. They also point to difficulties with our road, rail and port systems, which are obviously a major problem for the economy. Growth is seen as averaging about half a percent for the next five years. State-owned enterprises are a major negative for the economy and the budget deficit. Next, year election, next year's election, of course, adds further uncertainty given that the ANC may well lose that election. Transnet is collapsing due to theft, vandalism and rampant criminality. In its most recent year, uh, to the 31st of March 2023, Transnet reported 3,877 3, security incidents, which cost the company 3.7 billion rand in the year. 1,100 kilometers of cables were stolen. President Ramaphosa recently visited Richards Bay and said that the problem there was that the staff are incompetent and lazy. Well, that's nothing that we didn't already know, I think. Transnet's incompetence is resulting in a massive use of road trucks, and this is causing great congestion at port towns like Richards Bay, and it's also damaging our highways. Unemployment fell again in the third quarter uh, of this year to 31.9% from the second quarter's 32.6%. This is the eighth consecutive quarter that unemployment has fallen in this country, which is quite amazing. Financial services created 235,000 new jobs, and social services created 120,000 new jobs. Manufacturing lost 50,000, and mining lost 35,000. Sibanya and Implats have both warned of retrenchments coming and there's been a major shift in this country from manufacturing jobs and mining jobs to the service sectors. Private credit extension in September was up 4.6%, which compares to August's 4.4%. Consumers and businesses are still very wary of taking on more debt, especially now with higher interest rates. Unsecured credit and credit card debt jumped 19%. Uh, and that, is, that shows that consumers are using their credit cards to pay for their uh, monthly expenses. Installment sales and lease finance were up 13.7%. APSA's Purchasing Managers Index was 45.4 in October, down from September's 46.2, and this is the sixth month that it's been below 50. Anytime it's below 50, it shows that manufacturing is shrinking. So manufacturing has been shrinking for six months now. Business activity component was down 2.8 points at 40.3. New sales orders were also depressed. Mining production was down 1.9% year on year. The demand for commodities was weak and prices were down. Mineral sales fell 20.2%, mainly due to precious metals. Transnet, of course, continues to be a major problem for mineral exports. Now, America is our biggest trading partner, with 21 billion rands worth of trade in 2021. About 20% of that makes use of our membership of the, the African Growth and Opportunity Act in America, especially our motor industry. Recently, four, four African countries were taken out of AGOA, as it's called, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Those were Uganda, Niger, Central African Republic, and Gabon, they were all removed for human rights reasons. South Africa is unlikely to lose its participation for that reason. But its relationship with Russia and China, and particularly its attitude towards Ukraine and now towards Gaza, 
could be a big problem. In our view, the U.S. will probably keep South Africa in a goer in the African Growth and Opportunity Act in order to prevent it from getting closer to Russia and China. Okay, South Africa's immigration policies, I apologize for that, that's just load shedding, right? Normal phenomena here in this country. South Africa's immigration policies need revision. That's what the Department of Home Affairs is now saying. <clears throat> Since the 1994 elections, our borders have been very porous and millions and millions of people have come into this country, especially from Zimbabwe, as they sought to escape the economic disasters in their own countries. They get jobs here, <clears throat> which of course then are not available to local people, and they send the money back to their families in Africa to the north. South Africa carries the burden of housing and employment for these people. So now the Department of Home Affairs says that the, all the laws which, con which deal with immigration have to be consolidated and revised. Suddenly they say now, after nearly 30 years, that South Africa can no longer afford its immigration policy. Of course, one thing about immigrants is that they often bring in much needed skills and they bring in a lot of energy to, for hard work. I mean, I'm sure that it's quite well known in South Africa that employing an immigrant like somebody from Malawi often gives you better results than employing a local because they, they tend to be feel insecure and therefore they work harder. The World Bank says that crime in South Africa is costing the economy about 700 billion rand per annum. It cuts our gross domestic product by as much as 1%. The bank says gross domestic product will grow 0.7% this year and be 1.5% until 2026. <clears throat> Crime causes a massive dislocation, misallocation of, res of resources. All right. Sorry, my f computer's gone off. All right, let's, let's have a look at the RAND now. Um, I just want to have a look here. I'll just get the chart up for you. All right, since the last confidential report, the RAND has been slightly stronger against the US dollar. I'll put a bit more data on the screen here. Um, okay, there's the RAND over the last five years. Here you can see the impact of COVID-19. Then the period of strength after that, which took us all the way down to a strong point here of 13 Rand 43 to the US dollar. Um, and that was in June 2021. Since then, we have been in a weakening trend as just defined by these two channel lines. You can see we hit a record level uh, over here uh, in June this year of just below 20 Rand to the US dollar. Since then, the Rand has been moving sideways and strengthening a little. Uh, <clears throat> but so far, um, it, is, it has lost 38.5% of its value in about two and a half years. The loss of value is because of the bad performance of our economy. The currency of a country is like the shares of a listed company. If the company is expected to do badly and make losses, then, then its shares will fall. If the country is expected to do badly and make losses, then its currency falls. And that's exactly what's happened in South Africa. Load shedding and the inability to export our raw materials is a great cause for concern. Overseas investors see this and, and they think that the economy is possibly crumbling. Luckily, the RAND is also impacted by international sentiment. And when the sentiment is risk on, as it is currently now with the S&P 500 rising, then the currency strengthens. So we can expect that to last until Wall Street turns down again and the sentiment shifts back towards risk off, which will happen sooner or later, I have no doubt. All right, let's turn our attention now to Eskom. Uh, the Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill is going through Parliament. That ex establishes uh, a transmission system operator, or TMO, whose function will be to provide a competitive platform for contracting and trading electricity. What this basically means is that Eskom will no longer have a monopoly over the grid. It will just be another energy provider competing with other providers. 
The change will be gradual. It's expected to take about five years in total. And Eskom is really battling with its electricity production. Kosili is expected to cost about 700 million rand to repair instead of the 250 million that was originally estimated. And the cost may be even higher, apparently. Eskom had a loss of 24 billion rand in 2023, which was double its loss of 2022, and it is now predicting a loss of a further 23.2 billion in 2024. It blames load shedding and also the 63 billion rands worth of debt which is owed to it by municipalities and which it will probably never get. It, it will get a 78 billion rand subsidy from the Treasury. That's part of the 254 billion rand of debt relief which the Treasury has already agreed to. Last year, Eskom paid about 37 billion just in interest on its debt. And of course, you mustn't forget it's still looking for a new CEO, a new chief executive officer to replace Andre de Reta. Its total debt has now risen from 395 billion to 423 billion. The cost of running open cycle turbines was 30 billion rand during the year because of the higher load shedding. And of course also the price of diesel was about 30% higher. Eskom's sales of electricity shrank by 2%, which shows that businesses and consumers are finding alternative solutions. In a recent uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers report, shows that Africa is now using about 6% less coal than it was, and that is mostly because of the drop-off in demand for Eskom's electricity. Production of solar and wind power increased from 20% to 26% of total power on the African continent, according to PwC. The chief executive of Volkswagen South Africa is a guy called Thomas Schaefer, and he's urged the government to quickly solve its electricity and logistics problems at Eskom and Transnet. Continued investment by VW in South Africa depends on it. It's important. The motor manufacturing industry accounts for about 110,000 jobs in this country. It also contributes about 6.5% of gross domestic product. And it's interesting to note that 63% of the vehicles which we produce in this country are exported overseas. So it produces a lot of foreign currency as well. Okay, let's look at some commodities. Uh, coal production is still a large part of South African mining for both local and export consumption, but the coal price has been falling. It's estimated that this year it will be 26% lower, sorry, that next year, 2024, it will be 26% lower than it was this year, and then a further 15% lower than that in 2025, demand is falling in the US, in Europe, and even in China. The coal price has fallen about 60% so far from its peak of $358 a ton. Tungela and Exaro, which are the two JSC-listed coal companies, have seen their profits fall, and we expect that trend to continue. All right, the gold price is up about 10% this year in US dollars since January. Um, and about 22.8% in rands. We expect it to continue rising steadily next year. Because of political uncertainty, the escalation of the wars in Gaza and Ukraine could cause the price to spike up quite sharply. Gold, of course, is a hedge against the weakness of paper currencies throughout the world. During a war, governments typically print money to pay for the war. This is what's happening in Russia, which is why the ruble has fallen to one cent U.S., most South African gold shares are up strongly this, this, this year so far, and the World Bank is predicting that the gold price will continue to rise next year. The National Union of Mine Workers has raised concerns about all the retrenchments in mining companies in South Africa. As commodity prices fall, mining companies are reducing costs rapidly. It's estimated that about 10,000 jobs could be lost by January 2024. Many of those will be lost because of the high cost of electricity. Transnet's problems on the railways and at the ports is also partly to blame. The ANC is likely to take to be blamed for all of this in the voting at next year's election. All right, let's look at some companies now. I want to begin by looking at Transcap. Um, all right. 
Okay, this is TransCamp. I'm just going to pull the screen in a little bit. All right, you can see that TransCap, which was a big institutional favorite up until April of 2022, it then started, reached a peak here and started to fall. At this point here where I put the, the green arrow, uh, you probably would have sold out. That might be where it broke down through a trend line. Over here, sorry, that is, that is the point at which it broke down through its 20% stop loss. So if you had a stop loss, if you bought it and held it all this time, saw it go up to 52.21 on the 28th of April 2022, and then it started to fall. When it reached 40 Rand, it was down 20%. So even if you had a, a wide 20% stop on this share, you would have been out of it by the 8th of June at 40 Rand. It then moved sideways for a while, and then collapsed, right, because of the trading statement that it produced on the 13th of March. That collapse was f went further once the financials were published on the 10th of May, and we wrote an article about it on the 13th of May, at which we advised you to put on this 65-day exponentially smooth-moving average and wait for a clear upside break. That break came over here, as you can see, um, and it came in, uh, in November, um, on the 6th of November at a price of 577 cents. Um, and since then, it's moved up very strongly. Our logic in this article back in, in May was that the taxi industry, although it's taken a bit of strain and has had to be reinvented, certainly going to stay in South Africa. It's not going to disappear. So the shares moved up from 577 when we had that break to current level at 799. That's where it closed. Uh, last night. That's a gain of 38.5% in a single month. That's quite a good return. All right, let's look at uh, another company, the Rhodes Food Group. Um, RFG started by Cecil John Rhodes a long, long, long time ago. Um, as you can see, the share has been in a long-term downward trend, okay, for a hell of a long time, but it's now gone through an upside break. It produces high quality foods for local and export markets, uh, bully beef and tin peaches and all sorts of things like that. Um, it, it produces both for the local market and it also exports a great deal of its product. Like all manufacturers, it has a lot of cash tied up in working capital and it's directly impacted by the level of consumer spending and also the strength of the RAND load shedding and port availability, these are all major factors for this company. In the year to the 1st of October 2023, its revenue was up 8.7%, but volumes fell by 8.3%. It made a 3.4% gain on foreign currencies, because the RAND fell through 13.7% during the year. It also acquired the company Today Pies, uh, so it, it's done a bolt-on acquisition of Today Pies, which contributed substantially to its, to its turnover and profits. It's good that this company does bolt-on acquisitions because it's a very strong way of growing. Headline earnings per share was up 35.3%, and the company is trading on a PE of uh, 6.86, which seems to us cheap. It's on a dividend yield of 3.86. And we draw your attention to this upside break through the long-term downward trend line. Okay, let's look at Mr. Price. Mr. Price, of course, is a very well-known South African clothing retailer um, in a very highly competitive industry. And again, here we've got a long-term downward trend line. The share found support at 125 Rand down here and recently has broken up through its trend line, as you can see there. Um, but this industry, the clothing industry, is a very tough industry. It's very competitive. And, of course, uh, they have to carry a lot of stock, so they've got a big working capital consideration. Uh, any miscalculation of fashion trends can be a disaster for a company like this and results in it having obsolete stock, which has to be written off or sold at a discount. Uh, it can also lose market share that way. Mr. Price used to be a cash-only store, but now sells a small per percentage of its product on credit. This means that they have a debtor's book, uh, which obviously adds to their working capital. 
And like all retailers, they have problems with low consumer spending, rising interest rates, unemployment, load shedding, etc., etc. In its results for the 26 weeks to the 30th of September, revenue was up 26.4% and headline earnings per share was down 9.3%. Revenue was boosted by the acquisition of Studio 88 and headline earnings per share was lower, probably mainly because of the discounts it had to offer on its products. Load shedding was four times greater in this period than in, this, in the equivalent period of the previous year. The company lost 60,000 hours of trading, and that costed 190 million rand. Double-digit food and fuel inflation constrained consumer spending. But the company added 121 new stores during the year. 58 of those came from the acquisition of Studio 88. Cash sales were 88% of revenue, which, is very, which shows that their credit policy of offering credit to consumers is very conservative Okay, and of course their gross profit margin was down 1.7% because of the discounts that they had to offer and also because of the weak rand. Okay, and here you can see the upside break through the long-term downward trend line. The company is sitting on a PE of 13, and when you consider that at its peak it had a PE of about 30, this means that there is good upside potential in this share, in our opinion. Okay, the next company I want to look at is Zeta. This is a newly listed company. It's, it's, it, it was spun out of Barlow World, and it, it, is, it is a company which, which controls, owns the, uh, the uh, franchises, the agencies for budget and rent a car. Budget and Avis, sorry, to rent cars. So that, that is a big business. It's got a turnover of around 9 billion rand a year. And as you can see, it listed over here on the 31st of December 2022. And it fell to a low level of 910 cents, but recently it's been gaining ground. It's been going up quite nicely. Um, in its most recent results, which are also its maiden results, um, for the year to the 30th of September 2023, revenue was up 12% and headline earnings per share were up 17.3%. The return on equity was 36.7%. What I like about this share is that it's sitting on a price earnings ratio of just 3.45, which is very, very low when you compare it to the JSE's overall average is about 11. So 3.45 is extremely cheap. The company did not pay a dividend, but plans to pay dividends from next year. And at that point, it will pay 20 to 30% of its after-tax profits. If it had paid 20 to 30% of its headline earnings per share this year, it would have had a dividend yield of between 5.8 and 8.7%, and that makes it very, very good value. We believe that the institutional fund managers have not yet recognized it as a, a blue-chip share, but they are beginning to, as you can see from that upward trend on your chart there. All right, finally, I'd like to just end off uh, this by talking about Lewis. As you know, Lewis is a very favorite uh, company of ours. It's a very well-known South African furniture retail retailer, it has 730 stores in South Africa and 138 outside South Africa. It retails mainly big ticket items, expensive items like, you know, lounge suites and bedroom suites and things like that. It obviously also is vulnerable to working capital management because it has huge amounts of stock and also a big debtors book. It's very much affected by consumer spending and the, and the high level of interest rates at the moment. But it, it has the capacity to make money both on the front end and the back end of any sale. So it sells, say, a lounge suite to somebody and then it finances that, that sale and also provides the, uh, the buyer with insurance. So it, it makes a profit on the front end and the back end of the deal. In its results for the six months to the 30th of September 2023, sales were up 4.8%. Headline earnings per share was up 6.6%. The debtor's book climbed 10.8%. It opened 29 new stores during the period. Credit sales jumped 19.5%, but cash sales were down 14.4%, which shows that consumers are under pressure. About 64.4% of its sales are made on credit. The company has extremely low debt levels and bought back 3.1 million rands worth of its own shares for 124.3 million during the year. As you can see from the chart here, just put a bit more data on the screen, it's broken up now through, through a, 
a downward trend, and uh, it's now sitting on a very attractive price earnings ratio of 4.9 and a dividend yield of 8.5%. This is a very, very cheap share at the moment. It's, it's a good investment. Okay, folks, that's about all I have for you today. I'd just like to remind you again to go down uh, below and in, in, the, in the description below and, and pick up the link to my Twitter feed uh, because I will periodically make tweets there as I see uh, relevant things happening in the market. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a, a, a great uh, festive season and all the best for 2024. The next webinar that we have will be on the 7th of February 2024. That's the first Wednesday in February month of 2024. Thank you very much for listening to me and I wish you all the best for the new year. Thank you. Bye-bye.